Late one winter night, just after the pub had closed, the landlord of the White Horse Public House, Bishop Stortford, was alerted to a fire downstairs. What the? Fortunately, the flames were quickly discovered and extinguished by the landlord before they were given the chance to take hold. Two weeks later, the landlord was again alerted to the smell of smoke. He was met with another small fire, but again was able to put the fire out. During the following two weeks, a number of other fires were lit across the town. Fortunately, these did not cause any considerable damage or injury. However, a shop in Hockrell was burnt to the ground, along with an adjoining barn. Evidence from these fires showed that an arsonist was on the loose in the town. This caused the residents great concern, and on the 6th of April a special meeting was called. Joseph Taylor and my colleague on my left is Fred Staunton, my colleague on my right is Bill Harris. Now we have formed this little committee but we need we think probably eight more people to join us on this committee to fight this arsonist who is loose in this town and as you know and causing great problems to us and to the police. Now one of the things we've thought of is to put aside a large sum of money as an encouragement to find this person. But first of all, we need to form this committee. So, are any of you willing to serve on this committee? Can I have a show of hands, please? Now, you, sir, you, sir, and you, madam. That's very kind. Very Following the meeting, a committee of 11 members was formed. A reward of £500 was also made available to anyone giving information which led to the conviction of the Bishop Stortford arsonist. Revenge is sweet. We defy you and your 500 pounds. We are strong. You are weak. If Searle and Dunnage do not come home, Stortford shall be laid in ashes. I am their captain and leader, and we are sworn to revenge. Searle and Dunnage, who were mentioned in the threatening letter, were from Bridge Street in the town and were recently sent to Hartford Prison, accused of stealing livestock. Family and friends of Sale and Dunnage were questioned by the police. Mr and Mrs Dunnage, thank you for coming to speak to us today. That's all right. Uh, as you're aware, we've called you in with regards to the recent arson attacks across the town. I'm sure you're also aware that in conjunction with this, that a threatening letter has been sent to a committee member on the Anti-Arsonist Committee. Yeah, I read about this in the papers only yesterday. Are you aware of its content? Yeah, from what I've heard and read in the papers, the arsonist threatens to burn Bishop Stortford to the ground unless our son is released. 
Please can you confirm for the tape why your son is in custody? Yes, I'm afraid to say he's awaiting trial for stealing livestock. Getting back to the letter, what was your reaction when you heard of this? Well, of course, we were shocked. So you have no idea where it originated from then? Like I say, we were shocked. So can't believe you're saying these things about us. We didn't accuse you. We're merely trying to establish its origin. If you didn't send the letter, do you have any idea of any friends or relatives that might have sent it? Definitely not. Mr Dunnage, do you agree with your wife? Of course I do! Mr Dunnage, please be aware that you are being interviewed and raising your voice does not help this situation. We do apologise. But we've no idea how this letter got started. It's causing us grave concern. Because lots of people think it was us that sent it. Only days after sending the threatening letter to Joseph Taylor, the arsonist struck again. set our shed on fire. I heard a loud bang and I saw a young man running off. I think he threw something at it. It's really blazing up. It's taken a real hold now. Tell me what happened last night. Yes, my daughter had just gone up to bed and she heard a loud bang and called me and I went upstairs and she was looking out of her bedroom window. So I went and had a look as well and the shed was on fire. Do you remember what time this was? Be about 10 o'clock. Yeah, it definitely was arson. Uh, still smell petrol and uh, I think this is a bishop's got the arson to go. We did see someone as well. Could you describe it? Yeah, yeah. Um, be about your height. Really short hair, but what hair he had was fair, and he had a black hoodie and jeans. Do you think you'd recognise him again if you were to see him? Well, I did get a look at his face, and I'm sure I've seen him around, so yeah, I probably would know him again. Okay. Due to the continuing attacks across the town, local police stepped up their campaign to catch the Bishop's Dortford arsonist. Police officers across the town conducted house to house inquiries with residents in order to obtain new information. Hello there, good morning madam. My name is Sandra Crichton, I'm one of the PCSOs from Bishop Stortford Police Station. Yeah. I'm just making some general inquiries about an arson attack that happened yesterday at about 10 o'clock. I'm just wondering if you've seen anybody acting suspicious or if you see anybody at all hanging around? No, I didn't. No. I would hate the best part of the evening to about half past 10 I think. Uh, did you see anything? Okay. No, no I didn't know. I was only indoors with the family as well. Didn't see nothing. Did you hear anything? No, nothing, see nothing at all. Now? No. Oh, right then. Sorry okay. About that. We'll leave you be anyway. All Thank right you. Then. Bye. Bye. -bye. Devils tremble, this is only the beginning. Before one week is at an end, you shall see such things as were never yet seen in Stortford. 
Five hundred pounds shall never bribe one of us to open our mouths, except it is to chaunt forth. Fire, fire, fire! Stortford, flames shall reach the sky. Read, mark, believe, and tremble. <gasps> to see you because as you know I've had two letters already from this arsonist and as I'm chairman of the anti-arsonist committee I want to know what the police are doing about it. Right well firstly I do appreciate that uh, you're the chairman of the anti-arsonist committee and secondly I do appreciate all the work that you and your team are putting in. What I can tell you is that uh, we do have a description of a mail from the last fire that matches the description of a mail that was seen leaving your address delivering the letters. Oh do you? There is a warrant out for his arrest because we do know who he is and uh, we're going to be conduct conducting an arrest inquiry uh, as soon as possible this afternoon and bring him in and hopefully interview him about it. Oh, well, that's encouraging. Mr Rees, why do you not have any alibis for the dates when the fires were started? You were spotted at the scene of the fire and our witnesses that you smelt of petrol. Can you explain that? There's also the case of the threatening letters that you sent. These have been sent away for forensic examination and they've been linked to you. You can't prove nothing! The second threatening letter was delivered in the evening. You were seen in the area. Can you at least explain that? I just don't know! I just don't know! Hi Mr. East. Thomas, you've been uh, brought here today because you've been charged with three accounts of criminal damage and one account of sending threatening letters to cause criminal damage. You've been mined in custody overnight until your court appearance, which is tomorrow. And the officers would like to take you to the cell, please. Three months after the initial fires at the White Horse, Thomas Rees was tried in court. All right. This is the case of the Crown versus Thomas Rees. Mr. Rees, you are charged with three counts of arson, contrary to sections one and three of the Criminal Damage Act, 1971, and two counts of making threats to cause criminal damage, contrary to section two of the Criminal Damage Act, 1971. How do you plead? Not guilty. This is a case of arson attacks across Bishop Stortford over a six week period. The Crown intends to show that Mr. Rees started these fires and sent threatening letters to a Mr. Joseph Taylor, head of the Anti-Arsonist Committee, which was formed to catch the town's arsonist. I'd like to call forward our first witness, Francis Anderson. Mr Anderson, is it correct that you were in Hartford Jail with Mr Rees in June this year? Yes. And whilst in jail, Thomas Rees confessed something to you, is that correct? Yes. And can you tell us what he confessed to you? Thomas confessed that he started a number of fires across Bishop Stortford and that he sent fretting letters to a man on a committee who was tempted to catch him. Mr Anderson, can you please confirm that you were in prison when Mr Rees supposedly confessed his guilt to you? Yes, I was. And being in prison shows you to be dishonest, does it not? Not necessarily. I know what I heard. And also, is it not true that you confessed your guilt to the prison governor only after you and Mr Rees had argued? Yes. I therefore put it to you that Mr Rees did not confess to you at all. I also put it to you that you've made up this story because of an argument and you wanted to get back at Mr Rees. 
I'd like to call our second witness, Elizabeth Shepherd. Miss Shepherd, on the 17th of April at 10pm, is it correct that you were walking along North Street, Bishop Stortford? Yes. As I walked along the street, I passed Thomas Rees. He seemed flustered and smelt of petrol. At the time, I thought nothing of it, until the next day, when I heard that a shed in the nearby street had set alight at about the same time. Objection, Your Honour. This is just hearsay, opinion. Objection overruled. When you say he looked flustered, what exactly do you mean? Well, he seemed a little out of breath, as if he'd been running. He wasn't walking in a straight line and he was bowing his head as if in an attempt to hide his face. Our next witness to take the stand uh, will be a Mr J H Mullinger, who runs a stationer's business based in North Street. Mr Mullinger, I believe that you sold ten sheets of white paper to Mr Rees the day before the threatening letters were sent to Mr Joseph Taylor. Is this correct? That is correct. And is it correct that the letters sent to Mr Taylor were sent away for forensic examination and were shown to have been supplied by your shop? I am aware that the paper was supplied by my shop. Mr Ballinger, I believe the paper you sold to Mr Rees is a popular line, is that correct? No, not really. But in any case, any number of people could have purchased the paper from your shop and written these letters, could they not? No, it's a very special paper. No further questions, Your Honour. I'd now like to call our next witness, Mr James Bush, a barman from the Star Inn in Bridge Street. <coughs> Mr Bush, can you confirm that you had a conversation with Mr Rees regarding the threatening letters which were sent? I can, yes. And can you confirm what was said, please? Thomas told me the letters had been delivered to a Mr Joseph Taylor, a main committee member. He also told me the near exact wording of the letters. Did you find this news strange in any way? Well, yes. As no one else had mentioned the letters, nothing had yet been printed in the papers. Mr Bush, I just have a few questions to put to you. Is it correct that you're a friend of Thomas Lee? And is it also correct that your Thomas Lee's father was on the anti-arsonist committee? Yes. Well, I put it to you that you learnt of these letters through Mr Lee and not through Mr Rees. The trial lasted a total of 13 hours before the jury were sent away to deliberate. It took them just 10 minutes to discuss the case and return to court to give their verdicts. And again, all rise. All men of the jury, on the charge of arson, how do you find the defendant? Guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Can we get some water, please? Foreman of the jury, on the charge of sending threatening letters, how do you find the defendant? Guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Mr. Reese, you have been found guilty of sending threatening letters. The sentence of this court is that you are not to hold, inherit or receive property for the rest of your natural life. You will also be sentenced to transportation to one of His Majesty's prison colonies and stay there for the rest of your life. Although a work of fiction, this film was based on real-life events and characters from 1825. On being found guilty of sending threatening letters, Thomas Rees was shipped to Australia, where he spent the rest of his life. 
His reasons for starting the fires remains a mystery to this day. <laughs>